Welcome to the Hope Sports Podcast, where we believe the best way for you to unlock your full potential is by living into your purpose. We believe discovering your purpose is the only way for you to live a meaningful life. I'm your host, Olympic gold medalist, Laura Wilkinson. Each week, I have the privilege of connecting with a different elite athlete to discuss how they win big in and out of their sport. We want you to compete better and live into your purpose, so stick around to hear about an amazing opportunity that we have for you. But first, let's get into today's episode. I was so honored to chat with five-time Olympic chaplain, Reverend Canon Dr. John Ashley Knoll. Ashley is currently living in Germany doing research and is an incredibly respected theologian and teacher. But what I loved most about our conversation is the way that Ashley draws parallels from his work in spiritual doctrine to the unique needs of athletes. His advice, it's so simple, but it's so profound when it's fully applied. He has so much wisdom after decades of working with athletes and being in and out of the Olympic villages. And he shares so much of that knowledge here with us today. So let's dive on in. Ashley, Noel, we are so excited to have you on the Hope Sports Podcast. Thank you for joining us all the way from Germany today. From Berlin, the capital city. Awesome. Now, okay, you're an internationally respected scholar on the grace and gratitude theology of the English Reformation. You hold prestigious degrees from Yale and Cambridge that we were just talking about before we started recording. You've received numerous international awards for your work. You're currently in Germany doing research. You're kind of like the Michael Phelps of the academic and theological world. Can you tell us a little bit about that background? Well, um, it's very kind, but absolutely not true. But um, I am uh, an, uh, an Episcopal Anglican minister, and I have done uh, research into the theology of the uh, English reformers, the people who were the equivalent of Martin Luther in England, and have written books about that. And I'm currently uh, continuing to understand and publish how they recovered crucial biblical insights um, during their time for Christians. But it's not just for Christians, it's actually really good sense because it's about appreciating the goodness of life and then responding rather than feeling that one has to earn uh, and strive to prove something. One can accept the preciousness of being created by a loving God for a good purpose and then live into that. Mm, I love that. Um, well, so how does this this background lead you into the world of sports? Because you now love helping athletes find purpose and spirituality in sport. There is a lot of loss and pain um, that comes with the territory of elite competition. The harsh reality is that everyone's joy is built on many more people's disappointment and heartbreak. How does a person find meaning in loss so as to have resilience and confidence and joy in executing um, the sport that they love? How can the difficulties not rob them of a sense of fulfillment in doing what they were made to do. That's the challenge of every athlete. And that's actually one of the issues of the Reformation. And simply what I do is understand the principles of what makes human beings flourish in the context of the 16th century how that works for people today, what insights about grace and gratitude. Wow. So many athletes shame themselves as the price of excellence, as the fuel to try harder, that when they actually do win, they have so emotionally cut themselves on the way up that victory is not uh, so much uh, an exuberant realization of fulfillment, but desperate relief that the fear of shame and failure has passed them this time. But as they say here in Germany, after the game is before the game. So 
no, not very quickly after there has been a success, the anxiety builds. Well, what about the next time? Mm. That's so true. I, I, how did you get into the sports world, though? Did you just see that parallel and, and you were drawn to it? Do you have some kind of sports background? Like, how did that kind of intertwine for you? Well, first of all, um, performance-based identity is not exclusive to athletes. And uh, I certainly understand what it's like to get caught up in pursuing something you love for the recognition that others will bring to you because of it, rather than for the inherent quality of doing what you love. And it's not a great leap to go from my own kind of academic success to uh, people in the arts, entertainment, business, or sport. When you are gifted at something, it is so easy to get your sense of well-being from how others respond to your giftedness rather than simply enjoy uh, exercising the giftedness. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when I in college and uh, I was asked to be a Bible study leader for some athletes, uh, it became very quick, clear very quickly th that... Um, People are far more interested in what an athlete status can do for them than for helping the athlete really thrive and work through the issues so that um, the uh, struggles lead to something bigger, bad, better, bolder, and more fulfilling rather than a downward spiral of darkness. And there are so many uh, articles today where Olympians are coming out and talking about uh, their loss of joy and the price, the emotional woundedness that became the price of their excellence. And I, as I tell athletes, it's so often athletes burn out before their talent gives out. Mm. It doesn't have to be that way. Sport can be a wonderful agent of healing people's emotional difficulties rather than doubling down on them. Mm -hmm. And so my work as a five-time Olympic chaplain has been to try to help athletes of faith and of no faith integrate themselves and to appreciate and recapture the joy they had in sport when they were young people before all the glitz and glamour came around and to hold on to that as an, an ability to express who they are, not trying to use it to become something they fear they're not yet. I mean, the great question for an athlete, are you complete now or do you have to win something to be complete? Mm -hmm. And if it's in the, the second half, then they're always pursued and no victory, no matter how global, will ever make them feel complete. And then the harsh reality of athletics is your body ages and you will retire. And if your completeness is based on winning this or that, then it, you can easily end up in a dark place. But it doesn't have to be that way. Mm, I love this. So you've been to five Olympic Games. What what was that experience like in the Olympic Village and working with, I'm assuming you worked with a lot of athletes that you hadn't ever met before, too. Um, yes. Uh, the Olympics is not a really great time to meet new friends. Uh, athletes come in with the perspective of trying to focus on what they're there for. And it's about maintaining um, what got them there. If you have relationships with athletes before, then you can be really helpful to them during. But some athletes, um, they may have a spiritual support system back home, and they'll come to chapel looking for it. So they may be interested in opening up a new relationship. Or um, 
I always say that being in the Olympic Village, as you well know, is like attending uh, 10 funerals in one wedding. <laughs> How's that? Most people's dreams die in the Olympics. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. Nobody thinks about it like that. Yeah. And even if you're nowhere near a medalist contention, you're from a smaller country. I have seen athletes be just as absolutely devastated for not making a semifinals and representing their country well as an American who got a silver medal. Mm. Because in our country, if you don't get a gold medal, then, you know, which is complete balderdash. But anyway, that's our culture. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, you've said that um, the greatest day in an Olympian's life is the day that they win the Olympics and the worst day is right after when they realize the medal didn't solve their problems. And I love this because, and I'm going to bring it a little bit down to my level, um, because you remember that old movie, Cool Runnings, about the Jamaican bobsled team? One of my absolute favorite quotes is from that movie. And the coach says, if you're not enough without the medal, you'll never be enough with it. And that has always stuck with me. And I remember hearing that before I ever made an Olympic Games. And I've been to three Olympic Games. I've won a gold medal and I have failed to medal. Um, I've seen about every reaction, you know, that athletes, when they win and lose, kind of like you were talking about, I've, I've seen them throw temper tantrums on the deck um, after losing and not, not getting on the podium. I've seen winners that go on to have a huge sense of entitlement and then kind of fall into a depression when they realize, you know, the whole world didn't change and their problems didn't disappear. You know, they were still following them around. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that's a lot of what you talk to athletes about what, I mean, do, do many of the athletes you talk to have kind of come to you with the same issues and, and problems or are they all kind of different? <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, so, so okay. Well, maybe this is a better question. Like, what are they saying when they win to you, and what are they saying or asking when they lose? Every athlete is an individual. Every athlete has a product of their own family backgrounds, their own level of giftedness, how easy it has been to achieve, how hard they've had to work, what their competitors were like what their personality is, you know, everyone is, is, has to be seen strictly as an individual. But there are certain themes, certain patterns that as human beings, we all share something called the human condition. Um, and that is, we are born needing the affirmation of others to feel complete. Scientifically, we know that babies need not only nutrition and sleep, they need loving skin-to-skin -skin contact with their parents. It stimulates hormone growth, probably even brain development, but that what defines us is not what we do, but by whom we are loved and who we love. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing an Olympic athlete does when they know that he or she has won the gold medal? Uh, I would say it's probably more of a sense of relief than excitement. But please, you may prove me wrong, but almost instinctually, when the minute they know they won, they will look to the stands oh, yeah. mm -hmm. or someone, a loved one, just looking to share the joy with. Because as wonderful as is the idea that I have accomplished my goal, if there's no one to share it with, it's empty. Mm -hmm. It's relationships that bring the greatest joy in our lives. And actually, one of the wonderful things about sports, it's such an excellent opportunity to make a lifelong relationships, to be part of a community. 
But sometimes in our training of athletes, we tell them to put their performance ahead of relationships. And that always ends poorly. The most difficult muscle to train is the one between the ears. And what makes it thrive is relationships with people who support you, but do not show disappointment in you when the results don't come through that day, who believe in you and love you. Mm -hmm. And considered a privilege to share the journey with you, no matter where it leads, because it's the companionship on the journey that it's the joy, not mm -hmm. the destination. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And athletes have such a privilege to develop really deep and meaningful relationships in the midst of the adversities of competition and the difficulties of life to have true and tested friendships that will be their greatest riches throughout the rest of their lives. Mm. So I just try to help athletes get in touch with that. And how do you go about doing that with them? Well, you start where they are. So it is not uncommon for a young Olympic gold medalist to really get caught up in the wonderful merry-go-round of the interviews and the A-list parties and going to the VIP rooms. Because even in the Olympics, uh, you would have thought that if you were uh, a, a member of the U.S. team that you would get in and one of the sponsors are there that you would get into the VIP room. But no, there are levels and hierarchies within the village. Mm -hmm. um, and now all of a sudden you're at the top of the A-list and maybe you're going to get on uh, 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 Jimmy Fallon or something uh, or the Today Show. That's a pretty heady experience, but it only lasts for six or seven months, and then your old news. And you stay with people. You don't criticize. You lay a foundation that this is great, but this is not reality for the rest of your life. And then when the disappointment and disillusionment set in. When the anxiety comes in, this is a, I've now tasted ice cream. I really like ice cream, but I have to win again if I'm going to keep getting the ice cream. Will I win again? Now I know how much I have to lose. It's often harder after you win the Olympic medal to repeat because now you're not the underdog, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore helping people remember that they're not defined by what they do, but by whom they're in relationship with and to help them ground themselves and to develop because of when you know you're loved, you can develop resilience to the adversities of the world. When you're trying to earn love by winning medals and you're not winning anymore, it's very difficult to have the willpower, the stamina to keep going when you're not sure that all that's going to do is bring more rejection. Mm -hmm. I love to say, Medals have to be earned. That's right and good. Love can't be earned. If it's earned, it's not love. Mm -hmm. And one of the difficulties in many athletes' lives, though it's not all, many athletes have experienced conditional love based on their performance. That when they win, even their families, mm -hmm. uh, give them extra attention and affirmation. And when they lose, they feel rejection. 
and they internalize that dynamic. And once they have, the joy of sport leaves and it all becomes about the treadmill of trying to make themselves feel complete by winning because apart from winning, they don't feel loved. Well, so can you give us some practical advice like on those lines? Like what are what are some things that an athlete that is looking to find this purpose and this love and these relationships um, that maybe has trouble separating, you know, that definition of their worth being in their performance? Like what are some practical things they can do to, to begin to see their value and their worth and to find that love that you're talking about? Well, it's not by accident that we're born into families. It's by design. And um, if you have a family that can be supportive of you, a parent or both parents, uh, siblings, people that just uh, treat you as a normal person who needs to make their bed and pick up the clothes off the floor and walk the dog and be around uh, uh, the Thanksgiving table, uh, enjoying the fact that we're in the family, that can go a long ways to really providing the emotional stability that athletes need to be able to face the challenges of elite sport. But we live in a broken world, and not every family is ideal, and not every parent's love is mature and uh, the best. No doubt well-intentioned, but parents can live through their children, can do expectations, all sorts of things. And then in those situations, then a family isn't a safe place. Then you need to find another place where you can be safe and affirmed as a person that your worth is is the fact that uh, you are a human being worthy of dignity and love and respect. Many folks find that in religion. Um, I'm a Christian minister. That's what I do, helping Christian athletes specifically understand that the whole Christian teaching that God so loved the world that he would come and die for folks so that they might be able to be restored to him and restored to that sense of love and purpose and that he, he is so loving that he has a plan for their life to use not only the good things but the bad things to shape them to something that bridges bigger and better and that that love will not go away even if they don't always do the things that they know that they should that um and that their athletic success um doesn't determine whether god loves them more or less in a given day mm -hmm. uh faith of uh whether it's christian or other faith can be a real stability that there is more in this world than just human affirmation, which is fickle. Yeah. If you, if an athlete uh, doesn't have good relational skills because of whatever their particular background is, and they're carrying a lot of emotional baggage, I mean, you're an excellent diver, and you may be able to win gold medals with a 300-pound sack on your back. <laughs> but why would you want to try? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> um, and getting a psychologist to sit down with you, to help begin to work through, to begin to help you evaluate what's a healthy way of looking at sport, what's a healthy way of someone's relationship with you. Are you being manipulated? Are you manipulating others? How? Because if you manipulate others, then the only kind of people you're going to attract are manipulators, and therefore your relationships won't be healthy, and you won't be healthy. And getting someone who understands those issues to help you get perspective and begin to know how to be a good friend and will help you find good friends. And then 
even if you're in an individual sport like track and field or swimming or diving or boxing, you still have a team. Mm -hmm. And these are, these are your peers who understand what you go through and you understand what they go through. And being intentional about developing healthy relationships with your teammates and realizing that they're a community. Now, I understand it's a lot easier on a soccer team where you all have to work together to win than when these teammates are also your competitors, like in diving or swimming or yeah. track and field. And that can complicate things. But you are in a community, uh, a special community, that you can find really lifelong good friends who will have your back and you can have theirs. And that sense of, of friendship can really begin to be fulfilling today not saying 10 years down the road when I finally win the Olympic medal, then I'm going to be happy. That's so perfect. At Hope Sports, we know that you want sport to be fun, but in order to do that, you need to compete with freedom. The problem is you believe that everything hinges on your score, performance, or medal count, but we believe that athletes should be able to experience joy regardless of their win-loss record. Because sport is more about the process of who you're becoming than the end result. We understand what it's like when the pressure to perform exceeds the passion for the game, which is why hundreds of athletes rediscovered their love for the game with Hope Sports. We have a workshop coming up November 15th through 17th in San Diego, California, and you do not want to miss it. It's so easy to get involved. Go to hopesports.org, sign up for the November workshop, and win like never before. So sign up today and come figure out what you've been missing. It could be the key you need to find success in your career. I, and you've also said kind of leading off of that, that uh, only developing the spirit and the body together can bring out the best in each. Can you kind of explain that? I feel like that's kind of going from what you were talking about into the next level, like not just finding the love and support so that, you know, your your results don't define you, but like, how do you actually bring your spirit and your body together to, to raise to, to a level that now that you don't have to worry about what your outcome is? Laura, did you ever experience anxiety before a major meet? Oh, yeah. And being a terribly well self-controlled person, like a light switch, you could just make the mental decision, I will not be anxious. And it worked, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> it doesn't work like that, does it? No. Even if you can control 90% of how your body responds, you, emotions don't work that way. And in the past, the way we've dealt with that is we've taught athletes not to feel, just to block off their emotions, to block it out and concentrate on doing the task. And in fact, many athletes use sport as uh, the great way to escape from having to face their relational problems. If their parents are fighting, I don't have to think about it if I'm focusing on my technique as I dive. If I am frustrated in my relationship with my girlfriend boyfriend, I don't have to think about it. Or in fact, I won't get an emotionally intense relationship because that could throw off my concentration. I'm just going to become a silo and that will enable me to become a machine so my body can always function at peak performance. Of course, that sounds good, but it doesn't work that way. Now, I have this little thing that I do, which will be hard to do on a podcast, but I make a little 
upside down bell shape on a piece of paper. And then I divide it, put a dotted line through the middle of the, of the upside down bell. And I ask athletes to write uh, bad emotions on one side. What would be some bad emotions, Laura? Uh, I would say anger, uh, maybe fear, like you said, anxiety, those kind of things. Rejection. Rejection, yeah. Hate, mm -hmm. shame. What would be good emotions on the other side of the bell? Uh, love, uh, support, excitement, joy, fulfillment. Yeah. Now, if you try to bat block out the bad emotions there's a little cork at the bottom of that bell and you've got to stick stick it in that little little opening at the top of the bell and if you put the cork in so you don't feel any bad emotions what else have you just done blocked your good emotions that's right you have become numb mm -hmm. now numbness is better than pain but numbness is not peace. And numbness easily becomes depression. And if you are going around emotionally numb as the price to be able to focus with a clear mind on your sporting event, when you win, as you say, you don't feel joy. If anything, it's just relief. Mm -hmm. And then what the sport used to give you as a kid. I mean, go back to being 10 years old. And you and your best friend race to the end of the street of Bach, or you dive in and you swim to the dock and back. It matters who wins. But it doesn't matter who wins. You give everything you have and you come back and you fall on the ground and you're laughing because you've done something you enjoy to do with someone you enjoy to be with. It was only as you enjoyed sport that you discovered, oh, wow, I'm actually really good at this. And then being good at it begins to take over why you do it rather than just the sheer joy of doing something you love with people you love. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the way to help athletes train um, themselves is to develop an ability to go back and be that child again. But you know, after you have suffered the pain of rejection and loss, you know, the best way, you can ask, ask, get a room filled of Olympians and ask them to think about their best victory ever. There's not a whole lot of reaction. And then you say, what about your worst, most embarrassing defeat? And all across the room, you can see the anxiety immediately flash on their face because defeat victory seems momentary but the shame of defeat seems eternal mm. will chamberlain do you think he was a good basketball player he was probably all right yeah. <laughs> when wilt was a sophomore in college at the university of kansas they were in the final four but they did not bring home a national championship shortly thereafter he he leaves now in Kansas, we figure, well, of course, <laughs> you have the talent of Will Chamberlain. <laughs> Why would you stay in Kansas? He doesn't set foot in Kansas for 50 years. Wow. We assume California, New York, <laughs> the world. <laughs> Why would you want to come back to Kansas? It's a great place to live, but who wants to visit? <laughs> He came back for the 50th anniversary of, of the team, and he said that he was too ashamed because he had let the people of Kansas down. He was too ashamed to come back. Wow. That's Wilt Chamberlain. De defeat in sport 
seems eternal. And you can't just make a mental decision to make that go away. You need to develop your spiritual side to have something from outside you. Just like you needed when you were a small child, Mm -hmm. even as an adult, something outside you to come in and assure you that that defeat doesn't define you. Mm -hmm. And that the loss in God's hands will build to something bigger and better. I tell athletes, uh, it's a it's a common thing now. Uh, there's been work done about contrasting a growth mentality from a goal mentality. Mm-hmm. And a, a growth mentality basically realizes that you can grow through winning and through losing. There's something to be gained to strengthen you to build to something bigger and better. Well, it is so much more helpful when your spirituality reinforces and helps you hold on to that in the midst of disappointment and defeat. Mm -hmm. That there is a God who has a good purpose for you and that he will take this disappointment and use it to bring you closer to the person you want to be and the fulfilled life you want to have. Mm -hmm. And that in his plan, everyone, no matter what level of athletic excellence they achieve, everyone gets a fulfilled life, not just the person on the top. That spirituality reminds us of God's intention for every human being to flourish. And it's not a zero sum game that only those at the top do. Because as you yourself know, being on the top by itself without being enmeshed in relationships, both horizontal and vertical, athletic, well, I've written a book called Real Joy uh, for helping uh, athletes to understand what Christianity has to offer them. And the title is taken It's an incredibly awesome thing to be number one in the world at something. That's mind-blowing. But if you think it will solve your emotional problems, if you think it will help you find love and stability in life, If you think it will replace your need for spirituality, you're putting too much on it. Mm. And so because you have false expectations of what it will give, when you win, you will be disappointed. Not because that isn't a tremendous sense of accomplishment and joy in that feat. It's because your roots are not where they need to be, and therefore you can't appreciate it. There is nothing as cold as a gold medal against your chest. Mm. A gold medal on the outside won't solve your problems on the inside. And therefore, as you develop yourself physically, you need to equally be as intentional as developing yourself emotionally and spiritually to have the whole package to function as you were designed to function, to be healthy. And if you can be healthy in the midst of the pressures of elite sport, my, you have a huge head start on what it means to be healthy in the midst of the ups and downs of real life after sport Mm -hmm. that's so perfect yes where where can we where can we find your book real joy freedom to be your best i'm afraid um it is currently out of print and you have to pay outstanding 
outrageously awful prices um, on the secondhand book market, but um, <laughs> it will be coming out uh, in, within the next year. And there is a, a website, um, some, something called the Caritas Foundation, where they can, uh, caritasfoundation.org, C-A-R-I-T-A-S, foundation, all one word, where they can um, get some inspirational sport posters, uh, listen to some talks, and find out uh, when real joy will be available again. Oh, fantastic. We'll make sure to link to that in the show notes too, so people can can make sure to uh, find that and, and be encouraged uh, by all that. How, how do you prepare for retirement? Retirement will come as a shock, no matter how well you have prepared for it in advance. No matter how spiritually mature you are, no matter how financially secure you are, um, you're going to go from a life that has been carefully structured with clear goals every day to a blank slate. That will be jarring. You will go from a clearly defined identity, even if you say, the sport doesn't define me, um, in the eyes of everybody else it does. <laughs> and that easy sense of where I fit and where I belong is called into a big question. Do I continue to coach? Do I continue to be part of this community? Am I, am I a, an alumnus, an alumna? What do I do? How do I, all of that is now, which has never been questioned before. Um, but the worst thing is all of your personal issues that you have avoided because they distract from your concentration, no longer do you have sport to hide from them. And when your identity is in question, when your days are completely unstructured structured, and you feel at a loss, all of the emotional problems that you haven't worked through will come barreling down as one big massive avalanche and you know, won't know what hit you. Mm -hmm. I've seen a nationally honored, financially well-secured, emotionally mature athlete curled up in a fetal position crying saying, what has happened to me? Before you retire, begin in your last couple of years to really look at the relational issues in your life. Get a counselor because so often athletes put so much focus on their sport, they don't have the normal relational skills of everybody else because people want to be their friend. They don't have to learn how to be unselfish and think of other folks because they've got loads of folks that will spend time with them and then brag about it. Take time to work through particularly family issues. If you come from a family where it's not been ideal and uh, it's been a struggle, um, sit down with the counselor before you retire, beginning to work through them and learning how to set healthy boundaries so that you're not avalanched with them when you retire. Obviously, um, um, do your best to be financially wise. And finally, you will miss sport with all of its problems and all of its issues. That love of sport you had at the beginning, there will be a wistful longing like someone's cut off your arm and when it when it, when the when the storm clouds you can still feel the arm even though it's not there 
Therefore, as you begin to approach retirement, take a step back and realize this will not last forever. I am going to savor every moment of this year, of next year, of the year after, if there is one. I'm going to end with the kind of healthiness that I wish I'd had 10 years ago, but I'm going to end it well so that I know that I know that I can move on. No one finished business. Mm -hmm. And I think as an athlete who has been through that and retired, I think it's also important to note as you set out to make those great memories and to make the most of that last year, that it's not pressure to win everything that last year to be this certain person, but to just enjoy doing what you love to do because you won't be doing it after that. So I think for, for me at least, um, I mean, I think I, I did a little of both, but I wish I would have just really focused on savoring more of the enjoyment of doing it and, and how special that was and how much I loved it. I think that's a, just a little reminder as well. If I had to give one piece of advice to the athletes, what's the key to emotional healthiness in the midst of the fierce competition of elite uh, sport? Gratitude. Hmm. You work really, really hard to be where you are. No doubt about it. But if you didn't have the athletic gifting which you were born with, all of that hard work wouldn't make a difference. Now, I know you, great gifting without hard work doesn't do anything either. You put a lot in there. But being thankful that you have this opportunity, that you have this gift, and then think of all the people who have given of themselves to help you develop it. You haven't developed this talent all by yourself. And there's been a community from childhood and up. And when you're in the Olympics and you're in the final and the fear of shame and disappointment begin, just stop and think about how many of your teammates would give anything to be in the Olympic final. How many people in your sport around the world would give anything? You have the opportunity to, be, to push yourself um, by being with the best and to see what you can do and the gratitude for that opportunity and to enjoy the love of the sport. If you can do that throughout your career, it will make that last year so special and it will bring healing and hope that if in fact you have been so blessed during your sporting career, whatever comes next, you will be blessed too. You will be able to be grateful for the new things that will come in your life, as well as your ability to give to those in sport who come after you, like Laura is doing with these podcasts. I hope and trust that this gives you a sense of satisfaction of being able to uh, promote healthiness amongst athletes and um, to share the benefit of your hard-won wisdom with those who are coming up. Uh, it's been an absolute joy, and I, I feel, uh, I, I don't know, very very special and very blessed that I get to hear all these amazing stories and uh, meet these amazing people and, and also to understand that, that nobody's had this perfect road. Like, you know, we, we see people on TV at the top of their sport, winning the Super Bowl, winning the Olympics, whatever it is, but you don't know maybe the tragedy or devastation that led up to that point and what all they battled and went through. And um, it, to me, it's really encouraging hearing that because you don't always see that. And so to know that, like, you're not the only one who's been through hard times, or you're not the only one who maybe doesn't have a supportive family or, or whatever it is, like to know that you're not alone in that and that we're walking this journey together. I'm hoping that that's what some of the people listening um, can take away, you know, that it's more than just your sport, that you're not alone. There's more to life than just your performance and just your, your place at the end of the competition. Ashley, you are absolutely incredible. I love, 
I love the way you see the world. I love the way you see athletes and what we need and just how that parallels life so greatly. Um, so we just really appreciate you bringing, coming on and, and bringing some encouragement to all of us today. Wow, that was so awesome. There's so many sound bites in there. I just want to pull out and stick on posters so we can just look at it and take it in every day. But one that really stuck out for me is just how in an effort to avoid some of those painful emotions, we end up putting a stopper on all of them. So instead of feeling the fullness of joy when we win, it's muted. And instead of feeling that excitement or thrill when we win, we just feel relief. As athletes, and honestly just as people, we don't want to live our lives just feeling a fraction of all the good just to avoid some of the bad. It can be a challenge to allow ourselves to feel all the feels, but it's the road to wholeness. If you want to know more about this, then be sure to check out the Hope Sports website at hopesports.org for more resources and trips and workshops happening this fall so that you can become a more complete competitor and individual. Tune in next week for our conversation with legendary UFC fighter Frank Shamrock. Frank was named the fighter of the decade in the 90s and completely dominated across the board. He shares an exclusive look into his journey just for you here on the Hope Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Laura Wilkinson. Thanks for listening. This podcast is produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media. For more information on Hope Sports and to access the complete archives, please visit hopesports.org.